Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. I want to turn it over. I'm very grateful to Bob Berniga for taking the challenge here. And I think this is going to be a, 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 an interesting experiment of sorts because we, the seminar tends to be a deep dive of a subject, and Bob suggested doing a workshop. So this is going to be interesting to take this time and turn it into kind of a workshop, seminar slash workshop type of topics. So let's see how this works out and then give us feedback of what you think, okay? And we'll turn it over to Bob and crew. Thank you. Um, I thought I would start, or the speaker last night kind of opened the floor for this when he mentioned his, uh, his topic and then uh, electric vehicles. And so, of course, today I wore my uh, EVA DC, Electric Vehicle Association of DC, which is the oldest electric car club uh, in the country, and uh, because we're really into electric vehicles. And of course, the, uh, well, this isn't going to work, but uh, on the back, you see, you know, solar power is, is here to stay. So. Those are my other two uh, topics because this, um, this coming year, 2012, uh, is the year of the electric vehicle. Uh, this was the first year, uh, two electric cars, 2012, there's 15, the year 2012, there's uh, 15 uh, car manufacturers now are going to be producing electric vehicles this year, 25 the next year. and so. We will be electrifying most of our, not most, but a lot of our transportation and, uh, um, you know, for the commuter. And the thing that bothers me the most is that people um, try to um, compare electric vehicles with uh, gas vehicles and says, well, it won't do this and it won't do that. And my whole point is it was never intended. The electric vehicle is never going to completely re replace the liquid fuel vehicle. Um, the... Um, it is for a niche. And you say, well, you know, I'm not going to use one of those. But remember, right now, currently, you go down, you drive down Route 2 here, you will find 405 different models of gas car on the market. You have that much selection in gas cars. And so when you say that that electric vehicle is no good for me, well, you're also saying that there are 403 other gas vehicles that are no good to me because you choose the, the electric, the gas car that matches your uh, your capabilities or your, your interest. Um, nobody's forcing you to buy you know, one of those 404. You make your choice. So uh, it really uh, frosts me when people look at the one and only electric car or the two electric cars that were available this year and then they trash all of electric cars because that, that's not for them. Well, you know, there's, there's going to be 404 other ones eventually available for you that will match. So uh, I, I, I think that's the, the future. And um, and the more people, of course, who start to use their electric vehicles for commuting, which is the majority of what people use cars for, that leaves enough gas for those people who still need to use the gas to get around. So we're not in competition with each other. We're all trying to conserve the resources so that we can uh, continue what we're doing. And um, same thing goes for um, solar power. Last year was the year of solar power. We are now below break even. It's now cheaper to uh, install a solar system if you can find a place on your property where you can um, you don't have shade, and uh, you can now generate power cheaper than the power company uh, can. And, uh, and people say, well, what about the upfront cost? It's thousands of dollars. Well, take what you're currently paying for electricity, multiply it by five years times 12, uh, times 60, you're, you know, what you pay per month times 60, and that's what, how much money you will have spent in five years for electricity, and you'll have nothing to show for it. You will have spent 25, 30, $50,000 for electricity, got nothing to show for it. Would you rather spend that money now and in five years you've broken even and then the rest of your life, well, there's not much left, I guess, the rest of your life. <laughs> People in this room, but 
you'll have free electricity for the rest of your life. Anyway, I'm, that's, uh, you know, you got to think long term. <laughs> question. I don't know if it's a fair question to ask, but at the end of like 100,000 miles, when you have a gas car and an electric car, would, was the electric car cheaper um, to operate? Do they anticipate that, or is it more expensive? Or? At, at, at the end of uh, 100,000 miles, one guy bought a Volkswagen, the other guy got a Corvette. What's the value at the end? You know, uh, people, uh, uh, a lot of people say they buy cars absolutely for economy or, or for the end price at the end of five years or at the end price of end, end of 10 years. I don't know anybody that does that. People go out and they buy the car they want. It turns out, one, th you know, people talked about, uh, about the, um, High cost of the Chevy Volt and the Chevy and the Leaf. Oh, you're good to go? Okay, I'll wrap this up. And the answer is one third of every one of those 404 models of gas cars costs more than the Chevy Volt and the, and the Leaf. Already, one third of Americans are paying more for their vehicle than these two cars. And yet, then people say they cost too much. You know, it just doesn't make sense. People buy what they want. And so a lot of people, they want an electric car because they don't want to have to go to the gas and they don't want to have to stand in gas line when we have the next crisis. Okay, back to the topic at hand. Is there supposed to be a red light on that thing? It's running. It's running. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it, it was hard for me to figure out how to organize this talk because uh, it, it really covers the whole waterfront. Um, if you heard my talk, um, Yesterday or the day before, my number one frustration about uh, APRS was that it was supposed to be a, uh, a single channel that brings us all together. It's just kind of a clearinghouse channel where anything going on in ham radio, you dump on that channel, and then you have a device monitoring that channel that displays to you what's going on in ham radio around you. And the whole idea was, was so that we can maintain human-to-human uh, -human contact because uh, once the BBSs came out on packet, you couldn't, con you couldn't find a human uh, to talk to. And, um, and of course now, with all of these toys we have in amateur radio, every system is almost vertically integrated. It only talks within itself, uh, whether it's texting or whether it's voice. And, and so I, I, I've been trying to find a way to tie that together. So we came up with this idea, uh, what, a month ago maybe now, and said, well, why don't we have a workshop on universal ham radio contact? And uh, I, we, I talked about it on the various uh, SIGs that I'm involved in. And um, so we got some responses. Uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about it, introduce it. Uh, Mark Bronstein, uh, w who gave the talk yesterday on D-Star, uh, he's going to show how he thinks D-Star could possibly tie into this. John Gorkos from Atlanta is going to talk about his progress on ABRS, which is the term I came up with 10 years ago automatic voice relay system because back when APRS was mature and Echolink first came on the street, that's when this idea hit me. We've got to tie the two together because the, hand, the APRS radio uh, is like, it has caller ID, you know, you can see who's, uh, we've got the signaling method down pat and it's a global signaling method and e Echolink is a global VOIP net, uh, System. Why don't we tie the two together so that all I got to do is enter a call sign in my radio and I can communicate. So uh, John finally bit the bullet after 10 years and uh, has started writing code and he was writing it last night. <laughs> um, oh, and the other reason why this came about was a year ago in, um, or not, yeah, a year ago in Atlanta, um, they were doing a grand opening of the ham radio outlet there in Atlanta. And so they invited uh, APRS people and D-Star people, and it was just hilarious because, you know, here you are in, in Ham Radio Outlet. It's a room about the size of the front half of this room. And all the D-Star people were on this side all talking D-Star. All the APRS people were talking this way on this side. The donuts were in the middle, and nobody ever crossed the line. <laughs> and, and, and that's when I said, why don't we tie these two, two, uh, two things together? So, and, and so I kind of thought that, you know, D-Star, Echolink, IRLP, All-Star, you know, th those systems were, were the primary players here. And, but because these emails were flying around on the reflectors, somebody came back and says, well, what about ALS, automatic link, ALE? Okay, I, I blew it on this slide. Um, automatic link establishment. And uh, so 
we uh, dug around, and uh, Ken Heitner, are you here yet? He's coming from Northern Virginia, so he's going to talk a little bit about that. Because they do link establishment by call sign. D-Star does link establishment by call sign. Uh, APRS does everything by call sign. And uh, so this might be the engine that puts it together. The goal is any device, anytime, anywhere, to be able to make universal contact with any other ham by call sign, no matter what his device is. And these days, everybody's carrying some kind of wireless device, so why in the world can't we do this? Um, I got additional comments uh, from these gentlemen, um, and I, uh, I took their emails and tried to put them into a slide, so we'll, we'll get to see what they had to say. And then a few people responded with some some hardware items, and I'll try to, my best to give them some exposure. Okay, everybody, the original goal of APRS, like I said, was, uh, was never about vehicle tracking. It got totally off the tracks when people started making these trackers and GPS became available. The concept of APRS was presence. Who is on the air right now? And that's why a lot of people complained about, well, you're just transmitting the same thing over and over and over again. Yes, because I'm still on the air. I'm still on the air. I'm still on the air. Even if it's my house and it's not moving. The primary value of that packet is not that there's my house. Here's my house. Here's my house. That's, that's the people that are focused on maps. It's not about the maps. It is, I am an active participant in this network, and I'm here. So I'm still here on the air. So people who have been arguing about what APRS stands for, <laughs> it stands for the Automatic Presence Reporting System. Fool you. Okay. Um, and we all know how APRS works, uh, and that is every packet transmitted by everybody anywhere on the planet all gets just thrown into the internet. And anybody has access to that. It's not a closed system. It's just a telnet connection. Anybody can sit there and just watch these 30 or 40 packets per second uh, flying across the screen. And that's what gives us presence. We know everybody who has their radio on. Uh, on the planet, and by the way, we know where they are. Oh, and this was brought to us by the Sproul brothers, Sproul brothers, uh, Keith and uh, Mark, and uh, Steve Dempsey. Then, uh, with the internet connection, the problem is that's only five percent of ham radio. Yeah. Maybe I'm missing something about APRS, but if you're sitting there on uh, 14539, 14539, and you're broadcasting these packets out. And telling everybody what frequency you're, you're on. Mm -hmm. You're not on there. You're on 145.39. Oh, uh, <laughs> every one of the APRS radios that you know the manufacturers have responded with, every single one of them is dual band. So by definition, that person is listening on another frequency, uh, but, his voice frequency. But, but if it's dual band and you're transmitting on 145.39, then you're not transmitting on the band that you're supposed to be talking on. And if you, and if 145.39 even automatically interrupts your CUSA, I mean, that's no good. You know, so, um, you know, you, you're, you're transmitting on one or the other, aren't you? Yeah, but you're only transmitting a packet once every minute, you know, for one second uh, on the APRS channel. Uh, and, and if you're, it's your, your home station and you're sitting in your shack, you know, you're only transmitting once every 10 minutes or once every 30 minutes. You're just saying, you know, I'm here. And this is the frequency that I, the rest of my human anatomy is on, is over here on this VHF or UHF or HF or whatever frequency you're on. To answer your, to answer your question, and I have experience with the THD7A, if you're on a QSO on 440, uh, the packet reporting system on, 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 on two meters is, is, is suspended, so it won't interrupt you. And then when you get off the air, then you, you continue doing what you were doing before. So that's not a problem. Uh, you are correct that if, you, if you're over here monitoring two meters and you're, you're, you're commuting and you're in the, your normal two meter voice net, every time your packet goes out, you're going to lose one second because it does mute the two meter receiver while the two meter packet goes out. Okay. I don't think I've answered your question. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit clearer, but all right. Okay, uh, hang, hang with me. So the, the, the concern uh, for the last decade has, has been, okay, but APRS is only the 5% of people 
who want to uh, say, here's where I am. And, but that's because of the map mentality and the vehicle tracking system. And the other 95% of ham radio operators uh, have seen the map. They're satisfied. They have no interest in other people seeing where they are. And so I think we're, we're kind of on that plateau. What do the other 95% of ham radio operators use to communicate um, if they need to communicate some kind of uh, something other than voice? They use the DTMF keypad. We've been doing that for 40 years. Okay. And how do they report their uh, position? They report it by mile mark. And uh, from day one, APRS had the mile mark database built into uh, to your APRS map, so at any time you could call up where all the mile mark are. are. And so when Joe says, I'm at mile mark number 233, um, I can visualize where he is. And if I want to, I can just move my cursor over there, hit enter, and put him on the map there so that I can see him moving down the road, uh, as do I. Um, but we're still. We're still there. We have all these fancy systems, All-Star, Echolink, IRLP, uh, you name them. And they all use DTMF signaling and voice response. So, but the thing is about that is the radio has no display of who you're talking to, what node you're on, what node it's connected to. And that's when, in the year 2000, I said, for every system that we can connect into with any radio, and we're using DTMF, why in the world don't those systems also recognize the text that can come from this call sign? And so if I've got an APRS radio, let me set up that call by text uh, message. And it's the same thing. It's pushing the keys on, on, a, on a button, but you're sending a digital uh, thing, which is also displaying on your radio. And the node can respond and show you the call signs then of who you're connected to um, and who you're talking to and so forth. And remember, that's one of the things that the D-Star people really love, is that when they're talking to somebody, they see, their, they see the call sign on the radio. Well, with APRS, we've had that for 18 years. Uh, no, OK, the first, that assumes you have a laptop. If you, the first APRS radio came out in 98, so uh, almost 14 years now, we've had the ability to display the call sign of who you're talking to. So uh, that's where we're at, and I believe that's where I wanted to uh, go back, switch slides, switch uh, presentations. Because the reason this devolved is because I started, uh, when we came up with this idea of this conference, I started with my 100-slide presentation of APRS and started throwing stuff out and get down to what do I thought would apply in, in this regime. And that's what this presentation came up. And then a week or two ago, I realized, no, I need to start from scratch. And so I put together the two talks, and I haven't been able to merge them together. So um, this was the concept again. You got this many people in a the room, they all come to hear about APRS, and yet they leave the room, and all we see is these stupid little icons on the map. You know, these people aren't communicating. It's very frustrating to me. So universal contact by call sign. Um, and again, uh, I want you to try to separate the wheat from the chaff here, and that is I'm going to be talking, there's two totally separate topics here. One of them is universal texting, which simply means I have the ability to signal end-to-end, -end, you know, a couple of bytes worth of uh, information. So I'm going to call that a message, but don't think of that, that, you know, you're going to send some kind of um, a very wordy message. Just think of it you know, as tweeting or texting. But as soon as you have that, now you have a signaling method end-to-end, -end, and once you have a signaling method end-to-end, -end, why don't we use that for the people who have it, for who who has the APRS radios, for setting up uh, and, and making the links uh, through all these uh, VoIP systems that are out there. And uh, in the past, um, there were a number of methods there. Anyway, when I first, so this, now I'm right, now I'm on the text messaging. And I looked at it, and I looked, I counted up 26 systems, and you can count even more, it just depends on how you want to count, of systems in amateur radio that uh, send and receive uh, text information, and yet none of them, well, most of them don't talk to each other. Uh, all the ones in this box are APRS, and so they can all talk to each other. And of course, uh, everybody has a wireless device now and cell phones, and mostly the, the link from APRS to there, of course, is made, because you know, on APRS you can send a message to email to anybody. And now 
one of the topics of this universal text message, messaging initiatives is to make sure there's an app on every one of these so that it can talk back to APRS. And that's, we're pretty much there too. There's a, an app for the I, uh, iPhone, there's an app for the, it's called APRS Droid. There's an app on the uh, single laptop per child. I guess it would run on any uh, wireless device that runs Linux. Um, but then we have uh, Echo Link and all these DTMF users. So again, 2001 at Dayton, my big push was to say, let's tie it all together. Um, and here's the thing. All telephones can communicate on the planet. Why? Because everybody gets a universal uh, phone number. At least it's uh, universal within their country, and then you have the uh, country codes. But uh, going all the way back to the dial phone, uh, through touch tone phones, then portable phones, and then we got into cellular and smartphones. And by the way, you know, ham radio has been doing auto uh, patch since the Wichita auto patch in 1960s. Uh, so what was that? Uh, 50 years now we've been doing auto patch. And the interesting thing is, I still, I'm probably the last person in my area to still use an auto patch. And sometimes I call people, they say, what are you talking on? And I said, I'm talking on ham radio. And it says, it sounds beautiful. <laughs> They're so used to, to, to listening to this crappy cell phone stuff with this delay. You can't talk, you can't, you know, it's just crazy. And, and yet you go, go back to the audio patch and, and you can sound better than uh, anybody else. So why can't all ham radios communicate? Well, uh, we have universal call signs. Just like the previous slide, everybody has a phone number, everybody has a call sign, and it's unique in the world. And so um, why can't we all communicate? And the answer is we could. Oh. And the other thing that we have that the, the telephone companies d don't have, and that is the last mile. The, the problem with all uh, landline telephone companies was the inordinate expense of that last mile, installing that last mile of wire from the central office to every single buddy's house. Of course, that's completely obsolete now, right? Because you, as you saw, East Timor, uh, one out of every two people in the poorest country in the world has a cell phone. Because it's just, you know, you put up a tower, boom, everybody has a cell phone. Um, but anyway, for the last 60 years, we've had that last mile covered. In fact, we've had the last 10 to 15 to 30 uh, miles covered. And so that's why we keep trying to uh, attach our systems to other systems to take advantage of that fact that we've got the last mile covered. Um, plus, we have caller ID. I don't know why I put that... Uh, for 2011, we've had that since 1998, when the D7 radio, not even shown here, <coughs> uh, at least for APRS, you know, uh, you can see who, who you're talking to. Okay, um, this was out of my APRS talk. There were 300,000 radios about a, a decade ago that were made by both Yezu and Kenwood that had two-way DTMF signaling. It was a three-digit, uh, when you released, well, no, when you, Push down on PTT, and so you could see up to a 10-character message. Um, well, you'd see the call sign. Uh, anyhow, that little uh, BDD at the beginning said who you're uh, calling and, and who you are. So we had uh, caller ID in those radios, and uh, I, I got so excited about this because just in a day, I had a little pick processor that would sit there and you could connect it into an APRS radio, you know, the TNC, and it would take the, uh, any call sign that showed up on the map and then send it out on DTMF on another frequency, and then these guys would see who's nearby. Um, the only problem was, does anybody have one of these? Uh, TH-78 and the FT-51R? No. You do? Okay. So, so the amazing thing is they sold more of these radios than they have APRS radios. Where are they? Well, they're probably in my basement because every radio I've ever bought is still in my basement because by the time I'm ready to let go of it, it's obsolete. But um, you know what? My opinion is I think they're all down in East Timor and Indonesia because we know that Indonesia, uh, every frequency is saturated by, they go to Hong Kong, they buy bucket loads full of ham radios, and then they go out there and they use that as their uh, two-way communications. And the fact that they can then have one that does DTMF, uh, Sending a call sign, you know, it's selective calling on ham radio. So got really excited about that about five years ago, but again, couldn't find anybody then to, to take the ball and, and let's go with it. 
Okay, so that's why in the year 2000, I said, APRS touch tone. Let's communicate across this uh, boundary, both RF, the ether, and uh, the uh, internet system uh, by touch tone. These guys can enter information going this way, and they hear a voice response. Um, uh, and it was at that Atlanta meeting uh, one year ago when all of a sudden all the D-Star guys are on this side of the room and all the APRS guys are on this side of the room when I realized, duh, they've already got it. They've got exactly what I wanted and that is call sign to call sign uh, connectivity. Uh, they've got these smart nodes now that, uh, as Mark talked about yesterday, that keep track of everybody's call sign, know where they are, and so all you do is enter the call sign you want to talk to and anywhere on the planet um, you should be able to talk to him. So then I got super excited about that, and I said, we can do that. All we got to do is put up what I call it, because the way that works is, and Mark can correct me, uh, is the D-Star network, everybody talks into their local node stack, and the node stack then checks the uh, call sign database, and will connect them up to any other D-Star stack connected to the D-Star network cloud, and uh, they could communicate end to end. Well, why can't we have what I call an A-star that looks like a D-star node to the D-star network, but on this side, it uses the analog radio to talk to the user, and it uses the APRS packets to, uh, to always display who you're talking to and who you want to talk to. So again, this is the end user equipment that has the, uh, the voice capability and also the signaling capability, and the entire uh, network, both networks are already are, are there. All we need is, and if you can see, oh, I changed this slide last night. I got a laser pointer. Um, that all it takes is, uh, you know, the, the uh, is it called the DV dongle? DV dongle in D-Star, uh, so that you take any kind of laptop PC or anything else, put a, a dongle on it, and now you got the audio, and that's the, D, that's the audio side of the D-Star, uh, uh, or the A-Star gateway. And then when this thing wants to, display whatever it wants to display on this radio. Uh, it does that through the APRSIS, and the signaling from here goes into that to set up the call and everything else. So again, I thought this would be the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I shared it with a couple of the D-Star people down there, and, and they said, yeah, I'll take a look at it. Six months later, you know, I, that's on my list. I'll take a look at it. And um, uh, so they've got, you can imagine the D-Star guys, they've, they've got the whole future in front of them, and they've got a million things they want to do. And uh, so I'm still looking for uh, kind of this concept. Um, as I said before, a lot of these systems now can all inject the, uh, texting into APRS, and some of them can, can get it back so that we have this connectivity. Uh, Yezus jumped on board. Uh, their FTM 350R a year or so ago uh, uh, has everything new in APRS um, uh, built into it. Very happy with that radio. And then Kenwood just recently came out with the CHD72, which is their version. Uh, uh, well, they find to replace the D7. And the only reason they did that, the D7 is still a perfectly viable radio, is because they just, after uh, 12 years in the electronics industry, they just could no longer get the parts. Um, so they had to redesign a new radio. What's new in all of these new radios in the last four or five years in APRS is the provision on the uh, station list for uh, call sign. Uh, excuse me, uh, frequency, uh, to let everybody who sees that guy know what frequency he's on. Now, this particular display doesn't happen to be showing any frequency because not everybody has one of these radios. But even if you have an older radio, remember, you could put anything in your beacon text, and a lot of people put it in listening 5.2, and yet you get it within, in simplex range of them, and you call them on 5.2, and they're not listening because, again, they had to pick a frequency, so they picked 5.2. Um, the... Uh, the thing I would recommend that people do is, is put in a, and most of these dumb trackers have two beacons that you could select with a switch, and so put 146.52 in one of them, so when you're on the open road, you're telling people that I'm listening on 5.2, and in the other one, put in just a local repeater, the one you usually hang out on. Most people, when they turn on a radio in the car, they're on their favorite repeater. Put that frequency in there, and at least now when we see your icon driving down the road, we can see what frequency to probably contact you on. Um, Already mentioned, uh, uh, Jack wrote, uh, again, a, a, a texting 
um, window for this thing. It always can be running in the background because this is a super duper Wi-Fi uh, laptop, one laptop per child, 100 bucks. And it's, it's not really that, is it? Or they even sell them anymore. Anyway, the concept was uh, every uh, wireless device should have an app so that you can send and receive your uh, APRS uh, messages. And of course, George Lucas jumped in with the APRS droid. And the beautiful thing about um, writing an app for these things is you don't have to do anything with the maps or the display or anything else because that's already done. Because if it's a wireless device, it already has access to the internet. If it has access to the internet, uh, it just looks at the APRS.fi uh, map and, and that's done. So the, th the only thing you have to add is, is the texting. Uh, APRS, again, was never about maps. I can't stand that kind of APRS map. Somewhere on there, there are nine people. Uh, APRS was always about the network. Who's on the air and uh, what are they doing? And how can I talk to them? Um, so uh, I think I've already shown this slide. Uh, APRS was always about the uh, everything goes in so that at least we know presence when the, that the person is on the air and that we can uh, text them. Um, we have nodes everywhere tied into the internet. Oops. Um, and for, is there anybody here who has not ever seen APRS.fi page? Okay. Uh, anyhow, just anytime you're sitting in a computer, you got nothing to do, type APRS.fi. Go there and you'll get a map. Uh, you can zoom in anywhere on the, uh, on the planet and you'll see all the APRS activity. You'll see their track histories. Uh, and so forth. Well, the length of their track history is, depends on how, uh, how old the window you, you call up. But this has really made uh, APRS easy because you're driving through some, somewhere and somebody says, uh, well, where are you? And you just say, go to APRS.fi and you can see me. Uh, so now everybody has a view of APRS just by typing in six letters into their browser. And it's the full capability Google Maps. And remember, you click here, you get satellite view, and you, they can see your house. They can see your antenna in your backyard. They can see your driveway. They can see where you are. Um, uh, really fantastic. In fact, I, this is easier to use. APRS.fi is easier for me to get to a map and zoom in someplace than MapQuest. <laughs> so I use APRS.fi for non-APRS users because it's just so easy to not only go look at and see what I'm, you know, where I'm going in or where the hotel is, but then see all the APRS activity around me. And that's what APRS was always about. What is the, uh, what's going on at ham radio in a particular area? Uh, wrong button. And of course, this is going back to findyou.com, uh, which is the, uh, the, the original uh, internet system. And again, uh, you, you can see uh, all the messages uh, send and uh, receive receive. And so, you know, the, the messages aren't anything particular you'd write home about. But, uh, you know, it's hams communicating with hams. Uh, and the scope of APRS, 40,000 users, and, and that was five years ago. I don't know what the number is. I, I, I don't expect it as much higher because, again, I think we're saturated. Everybody that wants to look at a map is doing it. And the other 95% of ham radio are never going to do it, no matter how much you convince them that it might be a good idea. Now, this is another example of have you ever tried to maintain contact with your buds at uh, Dayton? Everybody says, well, we got 3,000 frequencies. We're, I'm going to pick this secret frequency. And then you find 13 other clubs are there, and everybody's talking on that frequency. So it's, uh, anyhow, APRS can do the same thing. And see, I'm zoomed in here. Remember, all the parking lots are down here and around here and around here and everything else. So we're not even seeing the other 300 people uh, at, at Dayton that typically show up on, on a particular day on APRS. You can see where everybody's parked in the parking lot. But yeah, these are the people that don't have APRS. All they have is an HT, but they can identify themselves through what I call APRS touch tone. Uh, all they do is transmit a call sign. Boom, we know they're in Dayton. And the, the APRS touch tone engine says, oh, okay, I heard you in Dayton. I'm going to make a list over here on the map of those people. And, and uh, so it retransmits onto APRS the positions for these DTMF users. They show up over in the woods so that they don't conflict with uh, somebody that might be out here. And it's very easy to see. Um, who's coming in by touch tone. The, um, and you, people have heard me uh, lambasting um, trackers. Now all of the people that used to make trackers, they all make a two-way tracker now, and they add a display because they're starting to get the message that APRS is not about what you can transmit, but what you can receive, what you can see about ham radio around you. And so this is the tiny track with the $34 added display. 
Uh, and every packet that comes in, you'll, you can see all the information on it. You can see, receive messages. You can even send messages. You've got some buttons here that you can cycle through some pre canned messages, or you can actually uh, laboriously send one. Uh, Open Tracker, uh, Argent Data Technologies, his trackers now. Uh, his text display is simply the uh, messaging capability that's built into the Garmin Nuvi uh, fleet tracking GPSs. And so when he wants to send an APRS message, he, he puts message on the GPS. The GPS comes up with a QWERTY keyboard, and he types his message in there. That goes into the tracker and gets sent. Any message that comes in gets displayed on his GPS. The problem is, is it's only compatible with the, uh, the new V350, which they don't make anymore, and so you've got to find them on eBay and so forth. He, he's constantly badgering Garmin to say, please open that up. Uh, or fix the bugs that are in your other Garmin devices that have this texting capability. Um, but they say, well, how many million do you want? Okay, and then uh, uh, you, you, Jason was here yesterday with his YAG tracker, and this is the, this is the newest thing. It's brand new, and he, they finally got the message that says, okay, this is, uh, you know, it has the TNC, it has everything built in. All you do is connect this to speaker and audio of any radio. And now you can play full APRS. Uh, it, it really is going to um, be a challenge for uh, Kenwood because now for 100, uh, I don't know how much it is, 150? Uh, anybody know what it was? Oh, 90 bucks? 190. For 190 now, uh, you know, he's got five or six. This is the station list, shows how far away people are. He's even got a map display. Now, it doesn't have any local map information, but it has what I'm used to in the Navy, and that is here's where I am and here's where the other people are. And, you know, that's all I want to know is, is how far away are the guys, and those two guys are together over there, and this guy's to the south of me, and so forth. And, oh, and of course, if, you, if this is hooked up to a GPS with a map display, there's your map. All those people are going to be on that map. But very quickly, you can see the situational awareness. So this is really um, uh, what I've been after. Um, it's the same thing as the Kenwood and the Yezus, all-in-one APRS radios, except now you can put it on any radio. Um, as I've said, the thing about the APRS uh, latest model of radios is it displays over here then what frequency these people are saying that they are on. And if you have one of them selected and you push the tune button, the radio instantly tunes to that frequency to the right shift, to the right offset, and to the right uh, tone. And these days, you know, everybody has PL on their repeater because why not? We got all these toys, let's use them. And, and we've completely destroyed the ability to just drive through an area catch a conversation and jump in on it. Because a lot of those repeaters don't even have PL uh, on the output. So you, you just can't join in a conversation anymore. It's very frustrating. But with APRS, you're driving down the road, you see these beacons coming from the repeaters themselves when, you, when, you, when you're in range, simplex range of them. So if a frequency comes in and shows up on the front panel of your radio, you know you're in range of that repeater. You push the tune button, and you've just joined the local um, voice network. Now, I said the repeater transmits this. No, it doesn't. This has nothing to do with the analog repeaters in the area. It has to do with the APRS users in the area saying, this is the repeater we think you should go to when you enter this area, and you'll find the, the most refreshing people to talk to. And uh, so the APRS people put that into their digipeter because the digipeter is what is communicating to you. So when you enter the range of a digipeter, there are three available slots in every digipeter to, to broadcast, to, to push information on the front panel of every mobile operator as to the local uh, recommended traveler's repeater, the Echolink node, the IRLP node, just any three frequency objects as to these are the frequencies you might want to use when you're in this footprint. And the reason you're receiving, receiving this message is because you're within this footprint. Um, also then, uh, the station list, which is 100 deep, you can imagine how, 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 many, how hard it is to find things in there. Well, the other thing they included was now all these radios now sort. You hit sort, you can sort them by time, you can sort them by distance. Who's the closest, what's the closest asset to me? Notice I, I caught myself because a lot of the things that are, are closest to you might not be another human, might be another uh, a weather station if you're interested in weather, but it might be what's the nearest um, you know, voice repeater and what's the frequency. Now. Um, and then you can sort by call sign. Now, what do you get when you sort by call sign? You get all the A's at the top and all the W's at the bottom. You can really quickly uh, go through that. But the thing I use that the most for is 
guess what shows up before the A's? All of the numbers, all of the objects that are a number, and what are the objects that start with a number? They're all the frequency of the local repeaters that you might want to talk to. So again, if I want to very quickly see uh, what is the new, uh, what frequencies has my mobile picked up since I've been in the area, I sort by call sign, and uh, they all pop to the top. Click there, push tune, and now I'm talking on that voice repeater. Uh, this is called the Local Info Initiative uh, in APRS been since about 2004 when we realized if the whole idea is what can you see on the mobile, then we've got to put something there. And the problem is it's only about 50%, I'd say, or even less than that. Half the digipeters in America are still not putting out this information as a service to people who come into the area. Uh, that's, that's, that's a crime. Now, but I don't have an APRS radio. Um, and I just showed you that there are several solutions to that. You could just take your Kenwood uh, D710 control uh, display head, plug it into any radio, the analog side of any radio, because all of the APRS functionality, Kenwood put it all into the, into the display head so that that can be used on any radio. In fact, they sell it as a separate product called the RC D710 uh, display unit. Um, and here's an example of where I, I took my display head hooked it up to an $88 Alinko HT. And so now, uh, when I take the uh, control head out of my car, if I'm in uh, New York or, or uh, New Jersey or wherever, because I don't want to leave my control head in the car, uh, I can bring it in the office, stick it on the desk, and now I continue to have APRS just uh, with any old radio out of my basement. There are other uh, radios that have APRS built into them. Yeah, like I said, Yezu now has four models. Is it three or four models of, of oops? of uh, handheld that has APRS built into it. Um, they, they focused a little bit more on the, on the tracking uh, device. It's a little frustrating to me because when a message comes, if a message is sent to you, the radio will, it will light up like a Christmas tree. It'll flash a bright light in your face. And you've got a message. But if it's not a message to you, it's just monitoring the APRS channel and storing everything so that you can go look and see what's there. Um, that's not reading the mail in ham, ham radio. Um, Reading the mail is when everything around me comes in, I want to see it right then flash on the display so I can look at it. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, Joe's nearby. I don't want to have to, well, let's see who's nearby. Pull out the radio, go through down the list, and, and click on everybody to see where they are. Um, there, there, there's a whole series of radios uh, from Yezu that, that do DCS, uh, digital coded squelch texting. Uh, I haven't heard anybody really talk about those, but there's no reason why we can't interface them in and send and receive stuff to their front panel. Um, APRS uh, has, you know, has had global email for almost a decade now. Again, any APRS message, you can also just send it to email, and it'll be delivered as email to somebody. Uh, we have a global CQ uh, server that you just set up. You just say CQ apples. And now anybody else who sends a message that says CQ Apples, now everybody will get that message because you formed an Apples um, uh, message group uh, globally. And it, you'll stay in that list for 24 hours, and then, then you'll be dropped off the list. But, and people say, well, but in other words, to join a list, I've got to send something? Well, I don't know if any of you in this room has ever called CQ, but we can have a whole bunch of people listening on 10 meters. But unless somebody gets on there and calls CQ, nobody's going to know anybody's there. And so you've got to call CQ before you'll, uh, you'll be, be able to receive. Um, and then again, this APRS touch tone, which I've been talking about for 10 years, and that is that bring, bring in the other 95% um, percent of ham radio operators. And here's what we're talking about today. And then once we have the ability to signal from any radio to any radio, uh, why not tie it in all, all the uh, VoIP systems? And uh, I call this iFi, and that is every wireless device ought to have a little uh, message app. And of course, then we have RFID, which we actually demonstrated at Dayton a, a year or so ago. So again, we've had global email. That's what it looks like on the old uh, uh, D7 uh, HT. And for those of you who haven't heard me say this, I was just, uh, I, I got a big kick uh, five or six years ago, I guess, at Dayton. The uh, ARL and Tapper had a special session on what are we going to do to save ham radio. All we got are these old fuds in the room, and we don't have any youth, and how are we going to uh, appeal to youth? And, uh, and as an example, they pulled out their cell phone and said, look, every kid in America can uh, send and receive text messages. The kids are just loving this stuff. And we don't have anything like that in ham radio. 
And I stood on my chair in the back of the room, and I said, what are you talking about? You guys have had this for eight years in ham radio. I can text message, call sign to call sign, anywhere on the planet. We've had it for eight years, and yet not one person in this room has tried it. And you're saying we don't have it? No, we have it. You just aren't trying anything new. And, of course, I'm a perfect example of that. Uh, I do APRS because I, I finally figured it out. Uh, um, I don't do any of these other things because I, I'm just too slow to, to play all these games on the computer. But anyway, so we've had text messaging now for 1998 for almost 14 years in ham radio. Um, the CQ server, again, APRS touched on. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Let me just go ahead and say this about this, because this slide does it. It says, well, what is my ham radio call sign on, uh, on DTMF? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm playing. This, uh, this is a D7, but just forget it's a D7. It's just any, any garden variety walkie-talkie. Um, now, when I get in the car, I, I say WV4APR mobile, just to let the community, to, to announce my presence. Notice the presence. We all do that in ham radio because, you know, people need to know you're there. Well, I could just as well do, okay, that was WB4APR-9, uh, which kind of lets them know I'm a mobile, and that did the same thing. Now, what does most voice repeaters do when they hear touchstones like that? They mute the output, so you don't hear that. But the repeater did, and the repeater then turns around and says, welcome, WB4APR accomplishes exactly the same objective on that local voice repeater that I have just turned on my radio, I'm on the air, I am present. But the difference is that got thrown into the APRS data stream and now worldwide my presence on the air, even if I'm going to 7-Eleven for five minutes, worldwide people know, oh, he's on the air. That's, that's what I'm talking about in this session today. And, and you say, well, how do you encode your call sign? It's just, you know, using the normal uh, text to a, a keypad. Um, but if it start, which is 9A is W, 2B is B, 4, A, P, R, and this is a dash 9. Uh, but if it starts with the A key, you know, and we're talking about the extra four keys over here. Uh, if, if it starts with an A, then we want every DTMF system to recognize what follows is a, a call sign. And what do I get when I receive this DTMF string? Well, I instantly know the call sign. I put a dash 12 on it because we've, in APRS, I've defined that to be, that means it's coming from a non-APRS device, dash 12, which hopefully is the other 95% of ham radio who have just identified themselves on DTMF. Um, I put in the latitude and longitude. I'll get back to that in a minute. Well, well, what latitude and longitude do I, I put there? Well, if APRS TT engine was running on a laptop in the back of the room, it would put the lat long of this room into that packet because that DTMF call sign was heard in this room. If it's on the local repeater, it'll put in a, uh, the lat long of the local repeater plus uh, a tenth of a mile in latitude. And you'll see what that does then is it builds up a list of people on the map it, in the vicinity of that um, repeater. It doesn't say this is where they, they are, it's just a way of building a map universal, uh, excuse me, building a table of call signs universally on every possible APRS app that's out there because they just look at things on maps and that's what this table builds up to be. Uh, the frequency. The node in the back of the room knows what frequency it was on when it heard that DTMF, so therefore it can tell the world, hey, I just heard him on this frequency. And, um, it can say DCC, uh, Baltimore, because that laptop in the back of the room knew that it was sitting here at DCC, uh, Baltimore. And so um, all of this information, which is 95% of what ha uh, APRS is about, presence, where are you, what time did you uh, turn on, and um, what are you doing, and how do I contact you? All that information is there. Been wanting this for since uh, the year 2000. So again, it, it does everything we want. Now, the interesting thing is, well, that was a pretty long, let's do that again. That's a, a pretty long, no, okay, but once I've done that, now the device in the back of the room or the local repeater knows that WB4APR is checked in on this uh, repeater with DTMF. Do I still need to say WB4APR? 
or why can't I just use the suffix APR? And as long as there's no conflict on that local node, then all I do is, um, whoops, went the wrong way. Much shorter, that was APR. So from now on, every time I get in my car on that voice repeater, I just say, and the whole world knows that I've checked in where I am, what frequency I'm on, and everything else. Well, what if somebody else's call sign um, also ends in APR? Then the node will come back and say, instead of saying welcome W4APR, it'll say uh, conflict, uh, you know, and now I have to send my full longer DTMF memory, and uh, it'll say, okay, that, that's you, and I'll recognize that as you until somebody else checks in and, and changes it. So, uh, again, that's not too much to ask. The first time you turn on your radio when you get in the car. Oh, and the repeater says, welcome WB4APR. So you don't even have to say that. Remember all the DSTAR users that say they're so much better than all of us because they don't even have to use call signs anymore because they just kerchunk their radio and now everybody sees who it was. Well, we can do that too. Um, for a special event, uh, the 5% of the people show up with APRS. They can see the entire tactical picture. There's no reason why everybody with DTMF can't say, I'm at checkpoint 13. All they got to do is blah, 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 send out the call sign in 13. It puts them on the map at checkpoint 13. Um, so we can see where everybody, all the DTMF users are, and then uh, everybody can see everybody. Now, how do they know what's going on? Very simply, uh, if the purpose of this event is to track the lead and the tail runner, you just tell the APRS TT engine over here. Are we changing tapes or something? Oh, okay. Um, we just tell this, this APRS engine that the, the, at this event, uh, announce once a minute the position of the lead runner and the tail runner um, all day long. So now these DTMF users are over here sitting on a, a, a simplex voice frequency or a local repeater, and now once a minute, uh, lead is 3.5 miles north of finish or tail is you know, 2.5 miles, whatever you want the, the voice uh, to, to, to report. So again, it's, uh, we still have tactical situational awareness. Everybody and, and the data is going in uh, automatically. Uh, now how do these things show up on the map? And this is the display where I said, everybody that comes in is heard on the 147, 105. Now why is this object here? The reason this object is here is because it's one of the, it's the local recommended repeater and so this is put on this map by uh, this, uh, this uh, the, the range of the Annapolis, uh, I bet our battery's going down. The, the range of the Annapolis digipeter is about this big, and so it is always transmitting this object on the map so that people know that that's the recommended voice uh, frequency. And now, again, when anybody checks in through here, they are, their call sign is just built on the map with the little te uh, APRS touch tone symbol. So um, well, this was made back before I solidified on dash 12 will be the uh, SSID for anybody that um, checks in by this method or any other non-APRS method. Um, I'm walking around Dayton and I just enter uh, uh, North Hall, that's 34. So all I would do is I would uh, press menu and then I would hit B32, oh and you put a, you always put a, a, D, a D on the end, you know, the OK. So I just put myself on the map to the whole world uh, at 30. Well, I put myself right here. Um, so it's even better than APRs because it works indoors. Uh, you know, anyway. Oh, and so this, what we had printed on the back of a three by five car, on the back of a QSL card, and everybody that came by the booth, we handed this to them and said, if you've got a DTMF radio, just uh, 
send your, your call sign, and we told them how to, how to spell it, how to spell your call sign. Put that into your DTMF memory number one, and uh, anytime you want to report where you are, just enter your two digits. Well, you, you start a position report with a B. Remember we said uh, the call sign always starts with an A, and a position report always starts with a B. Uh, there it is. And, and everything ends uh, with the pound sign, or the D, excuse me. Um, so anyway, and, and that's what we had this year. Uh, or a couple years ago, these people checked in just purely by sending their call sign, and these guys actually uh, transmitted a, a position. And you can do this in a PIC chip. It can receive the DTMS coming in, and it can make it that into an APRS packet and send it out. Uh, the voice synthesizer is the other direction. That's, that's a little more difficult. But a lot of times uh, at special events, when you just want people to say, uh, the runner number, some whatever, passed by checkpoint. You can do that with DTMF just as you easily can do that with APRS, and the whole world sees it. In fact, Bionics, you know, the maker of Tiny Track, he has a little DTMF daughter board that you can plug right onto a, a Tiny Track 4, and now it will do DTMF to APRS conversion. Um, he, he, he's not advertising it. Uh, you know, he kind of he works on it for a while, gets most of what I want done, and then another project comes in and he goes and does that. And then I've got to go light a fire under him again, which I'll do right after this meeting and say, we've got a lot more people now that might be interested in this. And, and he'll pull that off the burner and do a little more work on it. And when I say, for example, here is a, um, you know, you have a special event and you have a lot of different frequencies. This is 146.52, this is 147.51, and this is 446. Those are all frequencies. Um, and the APRS, the, the, the headquarters and everybody else who is anybody, is sitting there looking at their tactical display so that they can see what's going on out there. You know, objects, uh, you know, we've got a fire going on over here, we need an ambulance over here, and oh, we've got a few trackers driving around. Um, but uh, the way a voice network operates is every now and then net control, well, in fact, you're supposed to stay on the net until you check out so that the, the net control operator knows that you're there. Well, why couldn't I? Um, Every now and then, I just told him what frequency I was on. Now, and, and you say, well, you don't want to have those touch. No, you don't. That's not on the voice channel. You go over to a simplex channel that's doing nothing but listening for d this DTMF, and you've just said what frequency I'm listening on, so that you don't have to interrupt the voice net that is full nine uh, wall to wall with traffic going on. But you have just alerted. You've just put on the APRS map display that everybody should be looking at the fact that oh. And where does that go on the map? It puts you right up here and it builds that table. So in other words, you know, you can build these tables on APRS maps of information entered by uh, the touchstone users. Um, and here's an example I used at that same scout event. And how, everybody, who all heard this yesterday? A few of you, okay, but enough of you didn't, so I'm going to say it again because this was in the introductory APRS session yesterday. So we had this scouting event where all the Cub Scouts go around to these 10 stations and all the Boy Scouts go around to these 10 stations and at each station every 45 minutes they do something and they get a score for it. And the local ham radio club has done this for the last couple of decades and they, they set up headquarters here and the, the whistle goes and now all 20 of these ham radio operators wait for their turn to report the troop number and the score and then these guys are writing that all down by pencils and entering it into a database. Well, years ago, we said, we could do that with APRS. You just send in the scores, boom, they go right into the database. I soon found out, uh, my experience has been, we have great ideas like that, but they become nightmares when they don't work. So um, the thing is, as I said, I'm not going to automate everything. I'm just going to automate the sending process. And so uh, the first year, I convinced the... Uh, the old timer at the um, net control, we're all old timers, right? That uh, I'm, I, all I want to do, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, this is his laptop, it has nothing to do with APRS, where he has to enter the scores and things. Uh, instead of you using a microphone, at least myself and my two kids, that were manning two other things, they're, they're hams, uh, we are going to enter our scores to net control, uh, troop number, and score. And it's going to show up on this radio. Well, what does he see? He sees a list of what station it came in from, the time, and now at his leisure, he can, you know, scroll the cursor down, click OK, and he gets station number seven's uh, report, uh, troop number 874, and a score of 42. 
Um, and he kind of, when I said I want to push this data at you, he said, well, okay, put it there, but you know, I might not look at it. After the event, I was amazed. The first event, he said, that was the greatest thing that ever happened because this guy is trying to manage what's going on in net control plus 20 people trying to give him numbers, and he's trying to write them down. And uh, each person out in the field is standing there waiting for his turn to report a number, which means he has to sit there and listen to the other 20 people reporting their numbers so he can wait for his call sign to be called so he can do it. You know, that's the way we do ham radio, and that's the way we've been doing it for the last 60 years, and it's ridiculous that we're still doing it that way. Um, and so he said this was fantastic because he knows when he is busy, and when he is not busy, he can just go uh, click, click, write that number down, and then move on. Somebody then calls him, he stops it, he does what he, he does whatever he needs to do by voice, but he could go back to this at his leisure. Same thing to me in the field. I put in the score, hit enter, and then just put the HT back in my pocket, and I can go about uh, doing whatever else I'm supposed to be doing there and know that that message is going to be delivered. In fact, what you'll hear is, Brap! when you get an ACK, I know that it was delivered to his radio. I know that he got a copy of it. There's one more advantage to this, which I didn't realize till later. Net control, the ham radio operator, doesn't even need to do this. You give this to some Cub Scout sitting there and says, write these numbers down. And it's legal. Okay, the problem was there were only three of us with APRS radios at the event, but he said it was great. I wish everybody could do that. The next year we had five. But the next year then I said, you know, what are we, what are we doing here? It's all just a couple of numbers. Any radio, a ham radio has uh, DTMF, so why don't we just download this free software for DTMF decoded, and you can see when the report came in, and the guy, now ignore this, uh, this is if you're using one of those, remember the, the, th the uh, 300,000 radios that put your sending and receiving um, uh, identification on DTMF? Uh, that could come in like this as to who you're sending, who's sending it and, and what group they're sending it to. But just ignore that and just say that somebody type 99585. Oh, by the way, he also had to type uh, uh, no. The first thing you always do is... That's who you are, and then the uh, troop number, the score, pound. Done. At net control, just a laptop with just the speaker, the, the microphone on the laptop listening to the speaker on this uh, radio, and he's getting these reports coming in. I said, now we've got it. Everybody can do their reports this way. Um, all the APRS operators and anybody with a DTM FHT. The only problem was, that event that we showed up for this, every single one of those 20 people now finally had an APRS HT because they, they finally realized how valuable this was. They didn't like sitting there having to listen for 20 other people reporting one number and one uh, thing uh, and then their opportunity to, you know, do a call, check in, yes, Roger, go ahead, your number, yes, go and repeat that, blah, 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 blah. Um, they saw how valuable it was. So we got this all set up and we didn't use it once because by then everybody had APRS. But still, in most clubs, 95% of the people are never going to even touch APRS, yeah. Is the receive radio simultaneously listening, listening for DTMF or APRS packets? No. You, you're going to usually put this on a different frequency. Okay. Well, at a special event like this, um, where there's not that much APRS going on either, there's probably no reason to do that. But I would rather put them on, on separate frequencies, so that way they, there's no chance of a collision. Okay. And ham radio operators have plenty of radios, <laughs> right? Uh, and like I said, the whole thing can be done in a pick chip, uh, two capacitors and, and a, di uh, a couple of resistors, because you pulse width modulate the, a, uh, the, the DTMF. In fact, it's built into the, uh, the basic stamp. Uh, it can just send DTMF up automatically. So you take APRS packets in on the serial port, convert them to DTMF. I mean, you, you think outside the box. You don't just convert one for one. You say, OK, what is the information here, and what is the information I want to send to display on the DTMF radios? Uh, that's showed out of building. RFID, I just want to mention it because, again, this was another way of presence, of identifying everybody that walked into this room. And, uh, you know, most things when you go to an event, there's a, there's a sign-in sheet. Well, in ham radio, we don't need that because we could have RFID by the door. Well, no ham is going to go ahead and pull out his wallet and, you know, slide this by the little circle that's painted on the door. So for years, we could not figure out 
how to do this because all of the RFID tags that had a six foot range or a greater cost a lot more than the, the dollar that the, the, the passive RFID tags. And so we just never quite, we did a couple of experiments and again, you just couldn't make a coil big enough to, to catch the whole door. And then finally we realized, well, duh, you just go buy a six dollar uh, floor mat from uh, Kmart, put a big yellow dot in the middle of it, spray paint APRS on it, put the little sensor coil underneath that, and then put the little uh, uh, RFID tag reader over here, it's the size of a postage stamp, and a nine volt battery, and now you run a serial port, just two wires to a TNC and a radio, and now anytime an APRS uh, walks through that door, he sees APRS, he's gonna step on it. And of course, his RFID is in his shoe, okay? And so now we realize, okay, the people we're trying to have report are active participants. They want to be reported. So when they see a yellow dot, they're gonna just swing their, you really just swing your foot over it and, and you'll be picked up. So we don't have to worry about how do you detect uh, whether they go through the door. And if they really don't want their wife to know that they just entered the pub, they just go through the other part of the door and don't step on the yellow dot. Uh, so uh, that was uh, not last year, but the year before that at Dayton, I made uh, six of these and put them at these various doors. And so anybody, again, that uh, put, you know, your RFID tag, you can buy them that look like a credit card. And, you know, you could have your call sign on it and APRS and all that kind of stuff. Just drop it in your shoe. And uh, whenever you saw one of those, you could walk on it and remember, where would you show up? Uh, oh, in this case, because now we know, uh, now you would show up on the map, you know, a little table built above and below each one of these showing um, everybody that stepped on that one, or everybody that stepped on this one. And um, Lynn uh, Deffen Deffenbach um, uh, wrote the software then that would take, the, the RFID is just an RFID, totally random, but it's, it's your number. Now, how do we associate that with somebody's call sign? Very easily, anywhere on the planet, Somebody who has an RFID, all he has to do is send one packet into the APRS system that says, you know, when he sends the packet, of course, there's his call sign. He sends the RFID number that instantly associates that RFID number with his call sign permanently. And, um, and of course, the APRS IS distributes it all over the world. So now the next time we see that RFID tag number, it shows up as a call sign. And we put it on the map uh, where we heard it. The only problem is, came back from Dayton, and I was still too, I was too lazy to even go put it in my local EOC, and that was the original idea was, a lot of times a ham will go sit in the EOC and you know, go over there and have a meeting with the, uh, whatever, and it's, it's nice to know that there's a ham in the EOC right now, and if, if again, all that guy had to do was step on the yellow dot when he walked in, uh, that'd be great. I don't have a picture to show you that, but doing, anybody can do that. The RFID reader is 29 bucks. What comes out of it is 9,600 baud, the number. You run that into a TNC, what do you get? You get a packet with a call sign, which is the call sign of that um, floor mat, or that floor mat location, and the caller, the ID, and of course the thing that receives it associates, this is where that goes on the map, and you're done. So anybody can do this. It's just that it's really an application looking for an application, uh, so I toss it out, because it's another way of, of automatically reporting presence in ham radio. Um, You've seen all this stuff before. I did mention how uh, we don't do enough with mile marks for the other 95% of people whose presence is not known, but they do report it by voice every now and then. Um, traffic control. And so anyhow, APRS is not just uh, vehicle tracking. And I'm gonna, before we move to the other uh, speakers, I'm gonna go back to the other um, talk and picked up where I was, let's see if this, because remember I've been emphasizing that other 95% that already communicate completely by uh, DTMF, whether it's All-Star, Echolink, RLP, or Autopatch, but they don't have any display. So one th part of that goal is to say, at least the APRS operators now have a radio that can display signaling information coming in and can transmit signalation signal information going out. And so why don't we start using that as the end user equipment for those people who have it so that they have this permanent record of what they're doing while they're interfacing with these. So this, that, that call, involves these guys then adding a, uh, the ability to monitor the APRS-IS so that they can see 
so that these guys don't have to use DTMF. They can just uh, pick a call sign in their list, say, I want to talk to that guy via Echo Link. And again, that's what John's going to talk about here about AVRS. Yeah. What is All Star? All Star is another, uh, the question was, what is All Star? Uh, and it's just another uh, network just like Echo Link. I made the mistake of saying that to the author of All Star, and he says, it's not at all like Echo Link. <laughs> and uh, I, now again, I only became aware of it a week ago. Well, if you drive through New Jersey, you'll be very aware of it because there are a bunch of repeaters there that uh, are all tied into it. Uh, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but All Star is a totally software repeater controller echo link thing. The whole nine yards all rolled into one. It's just it's just software, uh, audio in and out. You hook to two radios, and now you've got an All Star repeater. I mean, you might have to have some cavities, but. Uh, in other words, you don't have to have a repeater controller. It does the repeater control functions plus the echo link interface plus everything. So that's why he says it's an all-in-one. And so um, uh, they just interface directly with radios. They don't have to interface to a controller. I hope I got that right. Yes, okay. Now, um, so again, what is APR's touch tone? And it's the ability, most of it is the ability to simply push the button send out your presence, which is just your call sign, and as I showed you, the thing that hears that DTMF string puts all the other information on it as to where were you when you did that and so forth. Now, how can we use that for setting up, um, well, so an APRSTT can be an independent device like a laptop in the back of the room with just an HT on it. Um, it can be uh, a simplex, and I chose 146.58, why not? You know, just pick a frequency out of the air, everybody else does. Um, uh, a simplex device in, in the neighborhood, uh, or it can be up at a, a, a repeater, or basically it can be at any device in ham radio that's already listening for touch tone. And as we showed before, um, just about everything is already listening for touch tone. So why isn't it listening for the presence of somebody by his call sign? That's really the message I want to send. Now. Well, you say, but the, the touch tone goes in. Well, here's what the APRS touch tone engine responds with. When it sees a, a DTMF call sign, it says, welcome, WB4APR. Now, if I want, and the packet goes out into APRS that says, you know, it shows you the frequency I was on, the time, uh, my call sign, my location within, you know, some, uh, the table on the, on the map. If I want to be more specific, I can say B, which means my position is, I'm at uh, 045 degrees at three miles uh, from the repeater. And it'll say WB4 APR 3.5 uh, miles northeast. And it'll put an APRS object at that location uh, on the map. It'll move me from that table uh, over to there. And you say, well, that's not very accurate. Remember, from day one, APRS knew about inaccuracy. And so uh, APRS can put objects on the map with precise positions uh, to the nearest six feet, to the nearest 60 feet, to the nearest tenth of a mile, to the nearest one mile, to the nearest 10 miles, to the nearest 60 miles. And when an object is put on with that ambiguity, the, what was supposed to be displayed is not a stupid icon. It's supposed to be a stupid icon until you zoom in to where the size of that icon on the map is, is covering that ambiguity. As soon as you zoom in below the point where that icon is no longer covering the ambiguity, you know, you're looking at the statewide map and the guy is saying, I'm somewhere in Annapolis, that's fine because your icon is the size of an Annapolis. But as you zoom in, that icon is supposed to disappear and a circle appears, an ambiguity circle. This is fundamental APRS. Most other authors refuse to put it in there because I know position to the nearest foot anywhere on the planet. I say, you might, but the guy who's sending it might not. And it is a violation of the integrity of APRS for you to put an icon on the map precisely when the person who's sending it is saying, I am sending this imprecisely, and I'm including the amount of imprecision. And that really frosts me when I see objects on maps that are shown to be precise when they're not precise, because position ambiguity was built into APRS from day one. Uh, and all it is uh, to make a, a precise, uh, an imprecise position is you just leave off the decimal point. You leave off however many of, of digits to the right that you don't have and that is not supposed to be plotted on a map below the resolution at which you can resolve that. Uh, I mean, the call sign still shows up, but it's supposed to turn into a circle once you zoom in so far. Uh, fought most of the other authors, and um, 
Some of them recognize it, some of them don't. Now, so now I'm on the map, uh, 3.5 miles northeast of, northeast of the repeater, and no, I'm not in some brothel up there. Again, somebody might, impreci might precisely put me exactly three, point, uh, or three miles. This is kind of a, I, I, I did this before I did this. Um, but again, my position, since I said three miles, I'm going to use the one mile ambiguity. And so there's going to be a one mile circle up there, three miles northeast of the repeater to show where I am. So I can report my position. I can also just hit the letters NQ, boom, boom. Um, and that's, I'm asking for the nearest person query. And it'll look in the APRS system. The APRS system says, okay, W3XYZ is 2.5 miles northeast of the repeater. Now notice, what's the reference point? Well, if you don't do anything, the reference point is the repeater or the APRS TT node that has heard from you. But uh, we've defined this whole thing. For, you can go in and change the, the reference. You can change the reference to, to this guy, for example, and now everything will be reported as a reference to this guy. So again, the, the reference can move. Uh, and so you, know, you might want to change it to the finish or the start line. At the beginning of the race, the reference is the start line. So all of these voice reports will be, where is somebody relative to the start line? Later on, about halfway through the race, you change the reference point to the uh, finish point, and now the, the uh, repeater will say, uh, it, the lead is 1.2 miles southwest of the finish line. So again, uh, a lot of people, when they heard APRS TT, they think that there's going to be some voice there reading off lat long numbers. No, you're thinking inside the box. You've got to think outside the box. It's, what can voice tell me? about position information. I've been talking about this for 10 years. Oh, okay. What else? Um, uh, message query. Are there any messages for me? Any APRS messages for me? Uh, you have three messages. Okay. Read number three. And text to speech, and it reads you the APRS message. Uh, now I say, okay, I want a QSO W3APC. That is the keyword that tells this APRS TT to talk to John's AVRS engine, which is watching the global system and says, oh, uh, this call sign wants to talk to W3APC. AVRS looks up where I am, looks up where he is, sends messages to both of us. Oh, and then it looks on an echo link, finds out the nearest echo link repeater, sends us both back a message that says, um, you have a call from W3ABC, QSY 147075 with a tone of 107. Uh, John will be talking about that. He's been working on it all, all night. <laughs> um, so again, this is the APR's touchtone engine for an event so that everybody can play, not just the 5% of the people that bring uh, APRS. So talking about APR's touch, uh, touchtone, uh, some, back in 2001 is when I wrote the initial version. I wrote it not for distribution, but just to show how easy it could be done. A $3 chip on the uh, um, parallel port would report DTMS signals come in then, and then eight resistors uh, on the parallel port as an output gave me synthesized voice. You know, I just recorded my voice and then uh, had a vocabulary, and it worked beautifully. Um, but I only did it to demonstrate, and I hope that one of these Windows programmers who has a sound card would just receive the uh, DTMF uh, and, and do the DTMF, and then would use the voice recordings to, to answer back. Uh, a zero hardware implementation. Nobody ever took me up on it until there was a guy in France, and last night I started looking around, I just could not find it. And they were excited, they did it, they got the whole nine yards, got it working, and I never heard from them again. Um, and I think it, you know, it was a flash in the pan, it just didn't quite take hold. Then Rick, W4PC, who writes this software called Radio Operations Center, he got excited about it, and he brought it, I believe it was 2009, to uh, Dayton, and we had the, we were developing those, we were showing those little maps. Anybody who walked by would get that little QSL card on it that had the, the two-digit grid so you could report yourself anywhere at Dayton uh, with your call sign. Um, and then he had a disaster, and that is somebody figured out the, his registration code, and now um, free copies of his software uh, were going around the world. Not APRS touched on, but you know, his, his, he makes a living doing this kind of stuff. And so he had to fight that battle of trying to get control of his software again. Uh, and so he dropped APRS TT. Then uh, Doug Cogliana, W2UPW, uh, built a version for, the, for 2010 at Dayton. And he just had it in a backpack. He had a laptop in a backpack. It, you know, you can imagine uh, what that does to the security these days. He just walked into Dayton and just set it on the floor, plugged it into the wall. And now, again, we had APRS TT at Dayton. And uh, uh, anybody that did their DTMF would show up on the global map. And he called it APRS Speak. 
and um, uh, Dayton has come and gone, and he still hasn't finished it. Um, in, in getting ready for this conference, I, uh, the all-star guy, Jim Dixon, W6NIL, uh, called me and said, what are you talking about this universal contact by whatever? And I explained to him, well, number one is if all-star is listing for DTMF, I want you to just recognize call signs and, and send out an APRS packet. He said, oh, okay, I can do that. Uh, next day, he says, done. And so sure enough, now if you um, go look at WV6NIL-2, which is, uh, uh, you know, APRs data FI, you can zoom in and there you can see his local all-star node has a little table of every time he's tested this and checked in on his local all-star node. Um, and that was one week ago. And Jonathan, I've been pestering him for 10 years to do this. And... Um, He's got plenty of other things to work on, and so this is always on the bottom of his list. But if, you know, if we get the ball rolling, and Jonathan is still, uh, you'll see in his responses, he still thinks it's a good idea, maybe we finally uh, reach the point of uh, kicking over. Um, and again, when you talk to the AVRS engine, you're identifying your presence, you receive a voice call, you, you do a QSO request, the AVRS engine, which I guess I did draw here, sends back the message to the APRS user as to where to go, what to do, and sets up the link or the DTMF user uh, is also involved in that. The other thing, I'm, I'm skipping from VOIP back to text for a moment because the other thing that's frustrated me is um, Echolink. I'm driving around here in a mobile and I'm hearing a, a, a conference server that is doing a, a, a Maryland DC section net and the net control shack potato is sitting in his shack and he's taking check-ins and he, he goes around the state all the different echo link nodes that are tied in, and he says, okay, in Western uh, Maryland, do we have any check-ins? No response. You know, he goes to each repeater in the, in the state, do we have any check-ins? Look at how much time we're using up trying to get information by voice of who's out there. Well, um, echo link has a chat node, and the net control is sitting there and looking at this chat node, and everybody else, of course, all the other shack potatoes uh, are uh, sitting in their shack, and they just say, check me in, check me in, check me in, check me in. That shows up on his chat list over here. And uh, so it, it's almost like he has clairvoyance. These other people that are not checking in are being checked in, but they're doing it on the chat mode. And so I've always said, let APRS play there too. Just simply have the Echo Link system always watching the APRS IS for messages. If they see any message on the APRS IS to any call sign, just look and see if that person is on Echo Link. If it is, throw that message into his chat window. Um, so that I'm out here driving around mobile, I hear this net in progress, I can send a message from my APRS radio that'll show up on the net controls uh, Echo Link chat window, which has been there for years, that says Bob wants to check in from Western Maryland. Um, and by the same token, if this guy wants to send me a reply, even though I'm not checked in on Echo Link, uh, APRS IS, oh, Anybody who sends a, a, a chat message, he can click a little box that says send this a copy to APRS. That enters the APRS IS system, and the APRS IS system automatically delivers it to me. So we can do this. Uh, oh, one reason, the initial idea, the reason that uh, Jonathan didn't want to do this was because he said this is adding a capability for, couch, for shack potatoes, and he is as frustrated with shack potatoes as I am, and that is, that's not ham radio. I mean, it's nice, but it's not ham radio. And he does not want to add feature gloat to the shack po uh, potatoes in Echolink. He wants to encourage people to be out there and use Echolink in the field. And so that was one of his initial reasons was he didn't want to add capability that benefited these guys. But my typical scenario for this is when I hear an Echolink thing going on, I don't want to interrupt the Echolink conversation, but I'd like to be able to send a message to those guys that says, hey, uh, I hear you in... in, in uh, Pipetown, New Jersey, um, and then, you know, the Echolink guy will see that on his chat note and say, hey, Bob, are you out there? And, you know, you get to join the conversation. Um, now, what is this? So the whole, so back to uh, VOIP. We have all these VOIP systems that can all, uh, well, I hopefully eventually they can all communicate with each other, and the AVRS engine then is uh, something that has the awareness of where everybody is and so when anybody comes in through any system and says they want to talk to somebody else, AVRS has, knows where they are and can say what they're nearest to and can tell them how to connect. 
that's the purpose of this uh, workshop today. Now, one other thing came up um, when I was talking to uh, Jim Dixon of All Star. He says, well, now, wait a minute. How am I going to deliver messages? I don't have any, you know, all I have is All Star is just a voice system. And I said, well, it's voice. It goes back to voice. You know, a, a message comes in and it comes out to voice. Well, it, he pointed out and also um, Pete Lovell also pointed out, I don't want to have my voice conversation interrupted by, you have mail, before APR is calling you from Atlanta. Uh, and so we realized that um, text to speech really has to be handled like voicemail. And that is, if a, an APRS message comes in, it immediately gets converted to speech. And it's sitting there now for when the guy checks in on All Star. He sends it his DTMF call sign. If the repeater's not in use, the repeater comes back and says, you have three messages. And, and you say, read number three, and you get to read your message. Uh, Jim Dixon then said, this should be at one central location. I was saying that this should be done. Each one of these systems would monitor the APRIS IS for messages and would know then who its users are and would keep its own copy of the mail. Well, some people play on all the systems. And so now, where is the last copy of the mail? And if I read it and say it's been read here, the next time I check in on All Star, now I get another alert that I've, I've got this email. And, and so, so Jim made the very good point, it has to be stored here. And then he said he's going, to he's going to, every message is going to convert to speech and store to speech. And to me, you know, oh my God, you're going to be storing megabytes of text that's really not going to be used, but occasionally. He said, no problem. He's got, you know, we got terabytes out there. <laughs> Memory is never the problem. And the advantage of doing this is he only has to have one text to speech algorithm that works consistently, and he doesn't have to put text to speech in every other possible system. Good idea. I agreed with him. And so, so the advantages of that, I don't think I made, a, um, I made the, uh, the summarize, is that it is only one text to speech algorithm, only one place where the uh, voicemail, whether it's been read or not, uh, exists. And by the way, you could check in on this from your dial telephone at home. You know, you just dial in, and it's, it's the APRS or the ham radio uh, voicemail system. And anybody can send in messages to that voicemail system by DTMF, by APRS, or whatever means they have. Part of this universal te uh, texting. Now, uh, in the next slide was uh, John. This is the message he sent to me. And he's going to get to talk here in a minute, if I ever shut up. And so he's written this AVRS engine. And uh, it, it currently does uh, the node stat. It checks the node status of IRLP, Echo Link, and everything else. It knows where all the APRS users are, and it ties it all together. And then it sends out objects to the, uh, to the end users. And I've already kind of described how we want that to work. Mark, um, who gave the talk yesterday on DSTAR, he, he, his email back to me uh, pointed out what I think we all know, and that is the DSTAR purists really don't want to have any kind of analog system uh, corrupt, corrupting their, their system. And I agree, that that's, uh, but at least we should be able to check into one of their nodes from our analog radio and listen. We're not corrupting their audio. And then once we figure out how to only give them good audio, which means, you know, like some time kind of uh, receive signal strength indicator that says, yeah, this is a quality uh, ham radio analog signal. We'll let that go back the other way. Um, he will also talk about uh, uh, call sign routing. He did that yesterday a little bit. And, um, and here's was, uh, uh, was there a talk yesterday about there's some new codec that's now in the public domain? So now you can add that codec. Well, soon. OK, possibly. Add that to the data port, you know, the, the, the wideband channel on the back of all of these uh, Japanese radios that have been coming into the market for the last 10 years. And so let's just build the, quote, D-star, but it, using this codec externally, and it just plugs into any radio. Um, so anyhow, I think he'll be talking about that. And um, in fact, why don't I stop here? Uh, everybody can. Uh, if you want to, grab a quick, uh, well, you got water in front of you. Do whatever you got to do. And then uh, we'll let Mark uh, start talking. And then he'll be followed by uh, John to talk about ABRS.